Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, so thank you very much for inviting me. It's a, it's a pleasure. It's also the first lecture I ever do from my home here in London. I'm still here. I came here for a visit to my wife in, the, in, in, in early March. In the last days that you could basically travel for <laughs> freely. And now I'm still here. And uh, it's actually quite interesting, this new kind of, kind of life. So this is uh, new for me. <clears throat> I have my cats around me and <laughs> it's quite uh, nice to do this domestically. Um, I want to say I speak in English because a lot of the material I, I show uh, is, is conceived in, in, through, with the help of English language or is done with international students. And in our institute, we, we basically speak English, but uh, occasionally I can say something in Deutsch. We can have Deutsch speaking on the Fragen. When there are Fragen, gibt, can we have Deutsch uh, common? Then I will answer them in Deutsch or English. Yeah, this is both möglich. But I will continue in English because I think it's uh, it's uh, the useful, the best language for us to to talk about this uh, <coughs> this work. Um, the, the introduction describes basically what I will will talk about, um, and I will towards the end of the lecture I will talk about the Bauhütte project in uh, in Berlin that has now started. We officially work uh, on a so-called Potentialstudie for the city of Berlin with the with Stable Project. That's the developer that is uh, that's preparing the Tech Republic for Table, and I will show what is going on there right now, what they're what they're planning and how Ber Berlin wants to create an incubator for, for building city districts uh, with wood using applying industry 4.0. It's a very practical application and yet uh, also linked to kind of global concerns. I will start with some of these, these global concerns. Um, and I will introduce uh, a bit this, this issue of conscious city where it comes from. And then I will talk about the kind of the two big themes that, that that concern us in our kind of uh, design work on urban scale and architectural scale, namely climate change and the, you could say, the digitalization of society. And of course, now the increasing intelligence that we, we, we give to systems and society. And this is changing our architecture, it's changing the profession. I'm on a commission that is advising the BDA, Aade Bund Deutsche Architekten, on, on these themes and how will the profession of the architect uh, or the architect team change? Uh, how, we have to, how do we have to prepare for this? And uh, it's not so easy this, to give this advice, make it uh, useful for the, the members and for architects in general, and in a way forecast what's, what can happen in the future. Okay. Um, Maybe we one word maybe before we start. The pandemic, of course, has 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 changed a lot, but the pandemic also has kind of pushed uh, to to the front uh, the the need for for this idea of the conscious city, namely uh, this Bewusstsein, uh, this the Stadt, and and this in Stadt Raum sein uh, is 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 becoming more and more important. We are still in lockdown here in London. My wife has just gone out today for the first time on a trip on public transport. The first time in three months, she's gone up to the other side of the city, you know, a trip into the wilderness. Uh, I only go out in small blocks, then I cycle to Hampstead Heath. You know, this is a kind of the horizon now that we we live in, and, uh, and at the same time we 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 work with numbers, right? Numbers of infections, numbers of death, uh, risk management, masks, and things like this—an extraordinary kind of thing. And of course, maybe one thing it does—it will affect architects very soon, or more than just personally, because we will have to work on new standards. How much space do we need? Uh, how do we design? How do you know, the streets around me are already being changed now? More cycle paths are being constructed very quickly. And of course, this is in a way a kind of, yeah, image of something that is, has been coming also for a long time, namely climate change. And the pandemic is global, but climate change has been global for a long time. It is not so direct, uh, we don't get ill, at least we think we don't get ill. So it's also important to, to learn from this pandemic right, what is happening globally. And perhaps uh, when, when we get somehow partly through this to, to learn how to uh, work with climate change as a similar thing as a pandemic. 
when you watch forth, much more lethal and dangerous. So let's go look at some games. Christina. So I start with, with showing some games that we introduced in the Art and Architecture Biennale in Chengdu two years ago. So this is the city of Chengdu, at least this is the model we made of the city of Chengdu. The city as exists now is the gap in the middle, the hole. And what you see is, is a series of new cities around the fifth ring of Chengdu. We were working at the time on, on a concept of a, of a smart city for Chengdu. This was a big wave and the Chinese government wanted smart cities everywhere. But people had no clue what it was. People didn't understand what it was. And so we devised a game for this Biennale uh, where people could play. And, and play with, with components of, the, of a game with which they built their own versions of this, this smart city. 350,000 people came. It was extraordinary. And you see, they're fun, they filmed it, they made little kind of houses, they built things. And they built, in fact, kind of all kinds of variations on this, this city. Um, maybe we go into the next video, Christina. Now you see what they're playing. It's a noise, it's a noise, the part of it. So, Christina, can you freeze it for a second? Yeah, okay. So what they do here, she look carefully here, what, what we are playing with is, uh, what they are playing with is dice, right? Beautiful. Uh, they spielen with Würfel, and uh, the Würfel they have <coughs> have so builder from, from from smart city system. So we designed a system, or, or, or a game rather, uh, that was built up of components of a smart city, and we invited the people to to play with these things. So if you look at uh, the red and the yellow, and they're all kind of different systems that deal with energy efficiency or digital uh, knowledge systems and so on and so forth. Of course, these people don't really know that. There's information on the walls on the left side. You see there different set of sets of these icons put together in scenarios for the future of Chengdu in China. The people didn't know this, but they play with it. So they play in a way <coughs> subconsciously with the components of a smart city. Uh, next, please. And yeah, and what we wanted them to do <coughs> was to feel that they could play with the components, even if they're not experts, not planners, not architects and designers, yet they could play and make a city. And we could learn from it. Originally, we wanted to make this, uh, this, uh, this dice intelligent, and didn't that, uh, as a few years ago, we couldn't do it yet, uh, to, get to, to, to get signals back to central core. <coughs> now it would be fine. Uh, and so this, we wanted to raise the consciousness of these people in terms of, of what you can do as a this is a smart city and that they can participate. They can be part of it. They can co-own co it. And, and different people can maybe create scenarios and those scenarios are a hint at, 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 at this, this word co-evolution. You know, that the cities is, are not just plants. They co-evolve with each other because people playing are like planners doing it simultaneously. So next, yeah. So this is my favorite image at the end of this game. Uh, <clears throat> These, these, these three little kids totally engrossed with this game and building their own systems or you know, little houses, but they're actually putting different layers of, of systems together by designing versions of this smart city. And for me, this is fantastic because, of course, these things will happen when they, then when they grow up. You know, this is their future. And what is important is that with these smart city systems, of course, we can define their, their future. We can start saying, we can give it tasks, this smart city, there's a design. We can say we want uh, to decarbonize the future city in which they will live. And then we want them to understand that and be part of that process and make decisions. 
so we would give directions uh, to the future through this, 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 this game. So gaming is important, and at the moment in the, uh, the current MA studio, uh, we teach gaming as part of, uh, part of the, the design work. Here you see our city design lab. There's not the studio where the students work, this is a digital lab. And here you see some of the infrastructure. Some of it is highly technical. There's some of this analog. So in the back you see them playing games, which we'll show in a minute. In the front you see a table where we link analog games to interactive technologies. With that we, we link up to maps that you see on the right hand side. And uh, <clears throat> with that we, we, we work now in the studio on, 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 uh, on future city design, in, in fact. And then we link, as where we link uh, kind of tasks to it. We say if we would like to create a future that uh, <clears throat> that is livable for people. That means that you have to control the temperature rising of the of the earth. And for that, we need to find new design tools. So at the moment, we are designing. We're using some of these tools. And of course, everything is online now. Like this lecture, uh, we have to shift all the work we do online. That means the analog work we don't do, although we could actually, but we we, we don't yet do it. And so in this lab, we have several tools. So maybe I'll show you a few more of the, the analog tools. Chris, uh, Christina, next, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> maybe just, just to really put to, to print on your kind of retina, right? The kind of two big topics that we work with. One is the climate change. And here you see some of the forces going around the world of climate change. And uh, <clears throat> this is the, what I call the digital mantle of the, of the world. It's like a, having a coat, uh, or I, sometimes they're called it the second skin. There's all this digitalization, all this data we now live with are like a mantle, a piece of clothing that we have, that we wear now as an earth. And those two things, they kind of, they kind of work together, they come together and we, we inter, make them interact with each other. And we say architects are in the middle of it. Uh, they, they, they can help us to, to work on this. And uh, yeah, go on, go on. And, um, so we, we call it, uh, this, this work, urban curation is a, a kind of design process. We use tools like the urban gallery. As, as some of that is without design. We, we just as we manage and we steer and we, we support, but some of it is going design because they'll go straight to design. I'll, do, I'll show some design projects later that we are working on right uh, on in the last studios, in, including Christina who's helping me run this lecture, who I thank for coming. Also, so uh, urban curation is indeed a way of, of, of planning cities uh, that are partly based on participatory processes and partly based on this, this question of how do, you, how do you plan and even manage to design a city of today? If you look at this picture, right, this was a project we did with, with Cora, there's a whole cloud of Coras around, this was the Cora here in London. In the, in the, in the green gray bit is a city district that we were designing for the city of London, <clears throat> it's in the, in the area of the Royal Oak where the high speed railway line goes into, the, into London and crosses the cross rail. So there's an area where millions of people will go in and out and so forth, and there's a new district plant. And we were designing this as a kind of preliminary design. Of course, we don't have the powers behind us that will make this happen. And then we said, okay, but we really want to look at this as how, you know, if this trend of smart city that was happening a few years ago, now it's kind of gone down a bit. How does it look like when you have it's total system integration? So we, we, we drew the city, which I don't really show you the design of in the green gray bit. Then the, below that is are all the systems, the infrastructure you, you need to, to make the city work. Uh, and and um, then below that, you see the most important part, the foundation, which is the human organizations that, 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 that manage and run the city. And then on the top, you get a new physical layer of a city that's the that's the that's the data layer and so the data flows are not virtual they are real they are physical things it's a new layer of the city and so we're now asking our questions how do we manage this how do we even design these things this is integrated systems where there's kind of blocks and stones and spaces that are traditionally architecture are, are, are only one part of it so next so on the one hand um yeah, on the one hand, we have these organizational systems of people. These are kind of human. I'm not showing pictures of people now, but I have some later. <laughs> but these are human organizations uh, that, that run a city, uh, that, that pick up, the, that organize the waste, that get energy going, that work in offices and things like that. 
but at the same time, so that's one extreme, I would say the foundation, and the other extreme is, 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 is digitalized world. Next, please. And that, um, that is, you see here, we started to, to de design the data. Of course, it's impossible. There's too many of them. And also, how do you draw data, right? So we try to, to pick them apart. On the bottom picture here, you see sensors, the sensors that we carry around in our pockets and that fill up our streets and houses now. And on the top, we, we create some sort of frozen image of data landscapes. And so now we've moved on from the smart city. We, we, we think this is going to be much, much more fundamental to change. You know, we're talking more about intelligence, but intelligence is made up out of these, these kind of data. Of course, the artificial intelligence. And now we have a new kind of co-evolution between human intelligence and the artificial intelligence. But that enters city making. So how to practice this? So we've done a series of workshops with uh, officials in Berlin that I just show you briefly because these are all awareness creating workshops. And what you see in this picture are people in, uh, where was it? This is Oberschöneweide in the south of Berlin here. This was a commission project with, the, with, the, with, the, with Vattenfall, with the people of the city. And they want to expand the district and they asked us to do a kind of game session with them. So these game sessions are becoming planning tools. And they're very simple. One hand, so it's just pure paper and cards, nothing else. So on the right hand side, we see this kind of digital analog table where we sit around. We have a card stacks. Yeah, we have a map and we have done some kind of architecture that we call the urban gallery. Next, please. And, and it looks a bit like this. Yeah, these cards are, are these cards with, uh, but cards of course refer to, to the kind of knowledge, right, about the city. And here you see some of these systems coming through. BVG, Stromnetz Berlin, Bündnis 90 and so forth. And on the left you see this kind of architecture where we, or, we organize them just to make you know, connections and to say, well, if these work together and they use this technology, they can lead to a kind of design like this. And this is what we call a kind of planning support tool uh, to, to work on the Kansas City uh, design. Next, please. And we, uh, we do that in a range. This is a European project with people from different countries and very low tech here with crayons uh, to kind of activate the map. And uh, the, the cards are exchanged. And so what if you have this sort of card, we do this and so forth. But they deal with kind of complex projects that cannot be just decided by a mayor or by, uh, by Beval Gay, because they connect so many stakeholders and you want to do so many different things like the decarbonization of a city uh, or making, getting more bicycles in a city. So this was another project in Buch also commissioned. And here you see a whole range of experts, some city officials, some engineers, some architects, some citizen representatives, and that's on the right, you see how they work. Again, still very low tech, still I'm saying, because then it shifts, right, to kind of that digital registration. So this is kind of bottom level design, way, very simple urban planning design, but we're always kind of exchanging opinions. So I would say this is the human intelligence that is being formed here. It's a co-evolution of human intelligence. We've done this in many ways, and if you start to do so, also in, in kind of uh, teaching, here are, we couldn't find a video, but here are students drawing an animated thing uh, in order to start designing Temple Hof, around Temple Hof. So we started to develop very simple didactic tools that it shifted to kind of haptic handmade thing. And the, 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 the test here is to animate something. How do, how do you create a dynamic design? So a design that keeps moving, that keeps changing, that keeps evolving. Uh, so again, that word for co-evolving. And how do you plan something there? keeps changing. Next. Yeah. Now, we, we are beginning to publish some things about these card games. This is a book that is years in process that is slowly coming out, hopefully maybe this year, maybe early next year, about the Taiwan Strait as a, as a kind of test field in which we uh, apply these cards to, to show how can you create out of a kind of region in the world, a, a kind of a conscious region, right? Where people negotiate with each other. And we do that because it's a conflict zone, right? It's a, it's a zone that's unclear. It's between Taiwan and mainland China. And uh, Taiwan and mainland China, I don't agree on the sovereignty. Uh, and uh, 
we, you know, European support mainland China in the sense that you know, we treat Taiwan as, a, as part of China. And, and so we started to talk about how can you make use of these games to design a large region, region like that. And of course, we cannot really design that large region, so we resort to kind of painting, right? Painting, coloring, and graphics to say, well, we could have do lots of projects simultaneously. And uh, we do this with making the cards. They're based on analysis, lots of analysis, lots of data comes into this. So we looked at the flows of goods and, and people and data analytics of knowledge exchange and uh, in this area of the Taiwan Strait, right? And then, next please. Uh, we create systems. This is one of the pages of the book. It's like a cookbook of, the, of, of design, where on the left-hand side you see cards, another graphic cards in the book. And on the, the right-hand side you see a kind of pop-up architecture. Right. You say, well, if you do this and this and this, uh, you can start setting up industry for the mass production, for example, of low-cost housing, which I will talk about later. And then we, we develop pages where you see here, thank you, it's good, um, the pages with, with pictograms that are kind of pop-up architecture, uh, hundreds and hundreds of them, kind of ready-made architecture that we can then bring into the game and we can say, well, actually what you need is this, this, this thing to create this mass production. Uh, and, uh, and so the book will contain hundreds of those. Then in the actual project, because it was a project that led to this book, we created some tools. And this is the first time we started creating interactive planning tools. This was a, a model that we, we developed in China, then we brought it back to Dusseldorf, where it was shown in an exhibition, in the Stilwerk in Dusseldorf. Then we took it back to China again, and it's an interactive model uh, with, with buttons where you can show this different scenarios, with lights, and that led them to something uh, that became a kind of interactive modeling space that's called the brain box. Next, please. So, yes, a, a few more images here. So this modeling device was, I call it a kind of painting and dynamic painting with which we could show the, 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 the kind of co-evolution of different systems. Uh, we, we practiced that with, uh, with, with students and, and experts from both sides of the straits. And, and that's, that's to this Conscious City project being effectively a kind of negotiation project, a mediation project between two sides, uh, two sides of the Taiwan Strait, to don't agree on basically basic sovereignty. And uh, now the issue that, that came up there is on the one hand, negotiation in, in design processes on a very large scale. On the other hand, this consciousness, and how do you capture some of this? So we, we I came up with this work of the brain box, and now next please and for a while we started to create a, a, a we worked on a space where we said well we got to know how this evolution happens we've got to design a space where these dynamics are visible dynamics of this of this region work so here you see a first version of this brain box where we, we try to visualize this consciousness map it uh, try to kind of turn it into a sort of control room where we could kind of play out scenarios and she you see then an application of that for the city of Berlin. We tried to convince the Berlin, city of Berlin they needed something like this. And of course, then we, you know, we kind of swiveled back and forth from, uh, from something you could call a smart city control room, right? Berlin has some of these control rooms, right? For the, for the public transport, for example. To a new space of democracy, because how do you decide on these things? How do you decide what is a more efficient system? And how do you decide on you, whether you want it or not? So we decided, we started to, to design this thing and that became a kind of mini architectural project in itself. And here you see a schematic version. Then we got kind of beginning of commissions. It didn't happen at the end, but then we, um, so we built a prototype first, which, which we showed in the Lange Nacht Wissenschaft a few times. Then in China, we almost built a, a, a very large version of this as an actual space of, let's say, proto-democracy. Of course, this is China, uh, so don't forget, there's still an issue uh, in terms of uh, political systems uh, there that are that differ from ours. And here we, we, we wanted to build very large kind of interactive room where on the one hand you have the gaming, you have the gamification, and the game playing, negotiating with each other, deciding on what the city could look like in the future. And at the same time, then it's where a kind of management room for the system she then need. Yeah, and uh, that didn't happen. So what we did focus on was the brain box for Berlin. We built it a few times at the moment. It's in storage, it's sleeping. 
and we discovered that the brain box can be a space for many things. So we can do games in it, we can have citizens in it, we can introduce citizens to, to, to interactive maps and, and tables, and we can do art projects, performance projects, music, and so on in it. And we did, and uh, that's for we ran it for a few years. Then we kind of moved on. We said, well, actually, hold on. We, we had to understand better what is the relationship between such kind of central room where you see scenarios and the scenarios themselves. And so we started to actually focus on the, on the, the scenario making and look uh, on a kind of a on a planetary scale, which I'll show in the second part of the lecture. It was quite fun actually, because what we discovered is that first of all, the Quora brain box attracts people. And uh, we, for a while we wanted to take it around Germany, it didn't happen, we didn't get the funding and so forth and so forth, so we left it. And then we started doing the games publicly and you see a few images of the games being played now by a, a broad public. Next please. And <clears throat> so uh, this is I think a bit of a video here. So here you see, a bit of the playing, this is what it looks like. So people come, they volunteer, they then they, they choose one scenario, they sit, they work with each other for a couple of hours maybe, then they hang up the results. And of course this is testing, and this is kind of raising a kind of public awareness for what you can, can, can do in general. And we, for us it was a learning process. How do we kind of run uh, direct scenarios? And this is something now we're also building in the, the Bauhit project for Berlin, kind of to create awareness for building in wood. It's not so, so easy. Next, please. And what really creates it an incredible kind of pleasure is the kind of mixture of, of ages also that we could involve. Maybe you can jump a few times here, Christina. Uh, so we had here again members of the public, but also kids came. Like an Wissenschaft. Look at there; they started to develop. No problem. Uh, they started to design. They got the idea of the game, <coughs> and uh, it's, so here he is designing. Then there's a card coming in, and, uh, and so you had, need to moderate. Of course, look, he's happy, <laughs> and, <laughs> and so this is extraordinary. So small kids up to five uh, could could play with this. Is. Now. That leads to indeed the next slide. Kind of, a, kind of. A, I want to make a big jump in here. Uh, it's you know this person, right? Greta, Greta Thunberg. At the moment, we don't hear about her because I think she's wisely stepping back uh, in the in the context of the pandemic. And the press have left her alone, but she, a few years ago, started to raise this issue with young girls and boys from schools uh, to to raise awareness of of, of climate change. And this is a really quite important point here because when I saw the, 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 the action and the ability of young, young children to, to deal with very complex issues in these, um, in these games, I started to listen very carefully to her. I was amazed at this, um, this the possibility that one young person like this could, you know, in the end, end up speech, speaking to the UN and, in, and in a, raise so much awareness about this, this cri the climate crisis. And, uh, <clears throat> So I was very impressed and uh, we, I started to think, what do we do with them? How can we learn from these young people and from their movement and to do, you know, what's the future of, of, of the world for in terms of climate change and how can we handle, how can these architects begin to play an active role in this? I have to say, I showed her some clips of her sometimes to some of the students and um, that was quite interesting to my MA students like Christine also. Yeah. And it was interesting because they, they admired her, but they were also kind of critical. They say, yes, but it's, you know, they can work up this enthusiasm and they kind of, uh, this, this, this strikes and things like that, but you need to be active as well. You need to have tools with which you can be begin to act as an architect and, and combat climate change. So since a few years now, we started to work uh, on kind of tool kits for architects to deal with, this, with, with climate change on a very large scale. Is really impact. So next, let's 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 now look at a few issues. This is what we work on. Had as part of the name of my 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 chair, my Fachgebiet. Uh, here you see an image uh, of 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 the. We're looking at. Yeah. I'll I'll stop for a moment. In the Earth's atmosphere.
Yes. Did it stop or are you trying to restart it? Yeah, here we go. Hi, this is Bill Pine. I'm a climate scientist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. What you're looking at is a supercomputer model of carbon dioxide levels in the Earth's atmosphere. The visualization compresses one year of data into a few minutes. Carbon dioxide is the most important greenhouse gas affected by human activity. About half of the carbon dioxide emitted from fossil fuel combustion remains in the atmosphere, while the other half is absorbed by natural land and ocean reservoirs. In the Northern Hemisphere, we see the highest concentrations are focused around major emission sources over North America, Europe, and Asia. Notice how the gas doesn't stay in one place. The dispersion of carbon dioxide is controlled by the large-scale weather patterns within the global circulation. During spring and summer in the Northern Hemisphere, plants absorb a substantial amount of carbon dioxide through photosynthesis, thus removing some of the gas from the atmosphere. We see this change in the model as the red and purple colors start to fade. Okay, let's, let's, let's move Meanwhile, a bit further. <clears throat> I don't want to show you that whole lecture, you can uh, kind of click on it. But so let's, let's look for a bit more in detail what happens actually, because it's quite extraordinary if you kind of create a section, like an architectural section, where uh, through that, those images we've just seen, you get this. Uh, this, is, <clears throat> this is ozone, but it's kind of similar to what he was talking about. Right? These are plastic structures. This is the space above the United States right here. This is kind of the architecture of the atmosphere. And it's really extraordinary because this is, this is what we live in, this is world. And it's you know, a lot of the, the changes we caused and will change our future drastically. And what we have to recognize is these are plastic things, they're environments that are themselves architectural natures. Next, please. Uh, so we tried to look at that and then of course the scientific data are, are really tough. Uh, this is a kind of typical graph of the annual CO2 emissions by world region. And you see what happens of course, right? Europe is kind of doing better, it's retreating a little bit. The EU as a whole is slowly going down. Of course now during the pandemic it's even more down but it will go up again. And of course the United States is a big chunk, Africa is coming. China has huge, huge growth. And if you look at the curve, it will just keep growing exponentially. And just the question is, how do we, we, we handle this? Is there, well, where can we start doing something that's not just a, a pilot project, some kind of eco system or eco house or something like that, but actually uh, we look at construction and, and, and architecture and urbanization on a, on, a, on a very large scale and say, where can we as professionals begin to have an influence on, the, on this process and, and to change some of this curve because we are of course responsible uh, we as architects designers city planners and and, and, and and citizens in cities we are responsible for 39 percent of the emissions and so it's a big chunk so if you look at this this graph here i repeat once more the climate change diagram the, 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 the data diagram because we have to we have to use technology um, and then we, we have to go towards curves like the one on the right hand side is my sketch, right? The rough version of the cities and society keeps growing, right? We have growing cities everywhere in the world, but we need to get emissions down. Otherwise, not, just know that the future is tough. Uh, it will just get hotter and hotter. And uh, I was just reading a book uh, on, on inhabitable Earth, and it says, look, it's, you know, we, we, are, we were trying to say we no way we should achieve two, two degrees heating of the earth. But now we are already saying, well, if we could keep it at two degrees heating, then phew, this will be okay. Because the reality is we're going to heat up by, by four or five degrees. So what to do, right? And there we, of course, we have to work with technologies to bring down the global population is going to go up. Maybe not forever, but it is rising. Emissions we can bring down, but at the same time we see we see an expo ex exponential explosion of, of data and of course intelligence that comes with it. And and what to do actually? 
what to do with this? And where, where do, when, you know, the point where these two cross, something really interesting is going to happen. We don't know yet. We don't know about robots and, and so forth, but uh, the, the growth of data and, and intelligence is like this curve, like a blue. So we have to maybe use, make this useful for, for climate impact as well in architecture. Which way do we go? Which way, which, which pathway are we going to take next? And it's important to be say, you know, okay, you know, I've seen the students, where I ask students, well, what do you want, right? Well, I want to work on this, but then you go in one direction. And then while you work in one direction, you discover that you like another direction or you have to change because you discover some other goal in your thesis or in your life. And it's the same with, with our society and architectural design. We cannot go on one goal. We, we have to go on, wait, go back for one second, please. Uh, we have to sh learn to work with different goals simultaneously. And uh, so the projects I show later, we, we, you have to see not as total as solutions. They, they, they coexist maybe as, as possibilities. Next, please. So I'll show you now some work that we do on, on the planetary scale uh, to, 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 to see how can architects work on a big scale. And uh, we started by looking at the Belt and Road Initiative. That's an initiative that the Chinese government started in 2013. Uh, it, it, it started to have a surplus of products and of production, and it started to say, well, we need to buy up infrastructure in, in the world to, to be part of the, the kind of globalization, right, of the world. And we have to invest in production and infrastructure elsewhere. Next, please. And, uh, and here you see that the kind of the first maps emerging that this investment uh, that started where the Chinese government literally invested in main harbors, train lines, uh, airports now, so worldwide. And we started to say, okay, that is maybe an important thing to look at. And we look at it in terms of urbanization. There are no architects at all around this kind of planning and design, but, ur but cities emerge around these points where, where, where these, these lines land. So we now, a lot of the studios we run are about kind of looking at, at, at the, how architects can be involved here because uh, as I discovered, I mean, I'm a lot in China, well, have been recently, not right now, but that, that, uh, that the Chinese government is also training urban planners uh, from different countries to, to, to come to China and then go back again to their countries and, uh, and then plan in these cities. And we started to think, hold on, is that helping us? Is that kind of, or is it simply creating more emissions? And just more, so we started to look in this and then I show you a bit of analytical work. Next, please. Uh, so I show you a few pages of anal analytics. Uh, we started, this is student work. Uh, students started to look at exactly what's happening in these global supply chains, this is what they are called. Uh, the Belt and Road is, a, is an invention of the Chinese president, but actually these are the supply chains with which we get our flowers and goods and stuff, basically, right? And uh, you see lists of the countries and how deeply they're involved in this, these, these supply chains. Next, please. And uh, you, again, you see this kind of worldwide, kind of, well, it's almost worldwide here, the, kind of the, the lines, the structures that connect uh, this, this, the countries and the cities to each other. Next, please. And then uh, this, this, these are students, this is student work. They started to look at the kind of performances of different countries in relationship to this kind of flows of the, of the, the goods and the money involved. Next, please. And then we started looking at profiles. These are profiles of investment and the different systems that the, the money is, 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 is channeled towards so that we know where can we start designing. And it's really quite interesting because these are highly strategic kind of investments that happen globally. And of course, if you look home, you know, Cologne has, has its Belt and Road investments. Duisburg is, has a smart city cloud that's run by Huawei. It's part of the, it's part of the Belt and Road. So Germany is affected. But we want to start looking at, of course, its urbanization, how cities are affected by, the, by these dynamics of, the, of the, the Belt and Road. And now we call it supply chains, right? Global supply chains. And so we started looking at a range of different cities and at the actual levels of the investments in each of the cities, now you see in East Africa and the Suez Canal, of course in Asia and Europe, of course. Uh, like I said, the city of Duisburg is heavily involved. And um, so we started to look at that and we said, then we want to see if it's, if, if it's possible to use it as a kind of basis of design. This is where the hack and flip comes in. 
because we wanted to say, look, we need to know enough out of, of this that we are able to hack into this system and eventually to flip it around because it's the largest architecture in the world and therefore perhaps the largest tool or instrument with which we can get architects involved in, in, in climate change. So what we need to, needed to do is some more analysis. So we worked on data spheres and we wanted to learn everything about this kind of global uh, construction. Next, please. And just take one example, for example, energy flows. So we started tracking energy flows. This is work of uh, two students in London. Next, please. And this student uh, also was able to code and process. So he is he, his data, and then he turned the data through Grasshopper into Earth model. And this Earth model, I call it now geodesign, is then a model of the flows of energy, in this case, actually oil flows uh, across the world. So look at this model for a moment. So this is a this is the design of the world, not as a as a, as an Earth, but actually as a, as a data model for the flow of energy. Uh, for example, Saudi Arabia is is it would be a mountain because this is where most of the oil comes from, and the users are then the deep the deep troughs. Uh, a lot of the world barely uses energy or doesn't make energy, and so it's a kind of creating an architecture of the world based on on on, on data and uh, data data engineering, but also data knowledge. And we, tr we try to, is there, then design it. So next, please. Um, and no, sorry, go back for a moment. Maybe one thing I have to say is, uh, is that this is dynamic in two ways. It maps flows on a daily level. And of course, you look at it turning. Next, please. So we did a lot of these data sets and we, um, uh, we created maps of data sets and then high Andres, and then, um, then we, we turned all of those data sets, this is urban population growth, for example, into these spheres. Next, please. So they're architectures. This is, these are worlds, kind of infographics. This is the, you see Africa as the fastest growing continent. Next, please. Next, yeah. So this is wheat import in the city. That's something that left, led to the big crisis in the North Africa. And these are, again, they're modeling wheat imports. Next. This is the Belt and Road itself, turned into data. Next, please. And here you see the kind of, this is a typical data set about the, the, the kind of environmental changes that we, 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 we affect in the Arctic, Arctic region. I'll, I'll show you a project a bit later. Next, please. And here you see the more, more of these sets of, of data that are now becoming kind of like in, infra, infographic worlds. You see a rice imports and so on. Here you see some details of them. They're, of course, they are 3D prints, but they're beautiful objects. And the right, you see the Suez Canal. It kind of flows through the Suez Canal. Next, please. Um, and here you see you know, some of the work on them. Uh, we many tests we had to do. There are many things that went wrong. It's not that easy to data, to simply 3D print these things. You have to kind of learn to design the, 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 the data set so that the machine can actually print it properly. Next, please. And with those data sets, we started to do design projects. Now we, we, we're going to go through some of these design projects. So they're all based, uh, or at least they kind of use this, this, this analytical knowledge of these, uh, of these data sets. Next, please. Have we used a slightly wider terminology? We said, look, the city growth is mostly happening around these uh, global supply lines. Let's look at that in different continents. So, for now three years, we've been looking at that on all continents. We've done some project. I show you three, four, uh, and uh, by different by different students. Next, please. So here you see just a kind of X-ray for a moment. What what happens through these the, the kind of these supply chain chains? Uh, these are flows of of goods, oil, energy, and other things uh, that that make up you know, that that feed us feed us as developed countries right this is the world that we well, that is why we, we live the way we live right we have cars and whatever right this is because of this kind of diagram in the middle you you don't see it you see indonesia but that's uh, we come back to that so for, we started to do design projects on a very large scale we said let's redesign some of this let's hack into it and kind of turn it into a new form of urbanism this was a project about, uh, about about looking at, at the kind of alternative forms of energy so we don't need the oil 
and this was a project about Mongolia. So if you look at the, the map, the, 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 the Belt and Road runs through Mongolia, and uh, this student, uh, the student team looked at, at exactly what happens, what could you do with the whole country of Mongolia? Next, please. If you start creating uh, alternative, that means solar power plants effectively in, in the, the whole country of Mongolia, and you link those to the Belt and Road. Here you see the Belt and Road as a physical infrastructure, the line that runs through Mongolia, and you, we, 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 as it were, build cities related to these power plants, and then we begin to export uh, these cities and, the, and their power plants along the Belt and Road. Next, please. And so here you see some of the, those, those three circles in the center. There are different city typologies uh, that's, that are based on the understanding of how could a power plant actually work? How could you connect the power plant to the design of a city? There's bits of design in the center of the page. Uh, this is quite, you could say, very universal architecture still. And on the right hand side, you, you see the kind, of, the kind of workflows. How do you get from this energy production towards the creation of design? of building kits for houses the next please and uh, so here you we zoom a bit a bit bit deeper into into kind of the city building kits uh, very geometrical initially but you begin to see it begins to drop into kind of the context of a river here as a river landscape next please and so we begin to look at building kits so you see it's very primal almost primitive architecture right architecture is a battery kit architecture is a biomass kit architecture as a housing kit, architecture as a resilience kit. And then the piece of landscape almost looks like bronzy, right? This famous architectural uh, kind of artist, I would almost say. And so we started to look at building kits. And then, of course, we, we have visions of what these cities can look like. There are many different ways. Uh, and, but this city as a power plant is an, an important theme. There's one aspect with which we can try to combat climate change if we can as we move, expand, and proliferate is along the supply chain lines. So these, all of these images I show, especially from here on, are student work, student projects, and I hope they're all properly credited. If not, then we would have to correct it, but I, I'm sure the names are all there. Next, please. Another project, for example, was a project in, in, in Indonesia, had a Green Cross is Indonesia a part of Indonesia? This was a student team that started to look at the, the products that we use, you know, like chocolate, cheap co chocolate cookies eh? and face creams, and they're all based on palm oil. Where does the palm oil come from? Well, these nuts and from trees, and these trees devastate, of course, the, the, the rainforest world, worldwide, and that's part of the problem of the climate change. So, can we turn those into kind of good things? Can we turn the tree into a good building material for cities? And eventually, can we substitute palm oil for bamboo? That's the project we're doing, uh, we're building up at the moment with Indonesia. Let's look at some of these images. So, here I just wanted to show you how some of these end products look like. These are four big A0 panels. I know you cannot really see the detail, but I just wanted to show you once at one time. That, that the projects I'm showing are, are massive presentations of four sheets that always deal with a kind of a vision, then a plan, and then the kind of flow, how, how are things built up, and then how do you manage this, and what's, what's who, who owns it, and who runs it. So you see four different panels here, but let's look at this project a bit more in detail. Okay. So the theme is here, the burning of the rainforest that you see on the right hand side and the, the exchange of that for the palm oil that you see on the left, which is a devastating product. And of course it creates, it just, ex you know, and, and the, the understanding that if we, we, we understand the value, to do the supply chains and the value chains of agriculture and expand them into city building value chains next. Yeah. So if we expand them diag diagrammatically, so the green is, is about creating the building kits out of, the, out of these materials. We can build, first of all, eco-cities or kind of uh, uh, you know, sustainable cities. And, and second of all, we understand enough that we can slowly move towards boot-based materials like bamboo. Next, please. So here you see then a typical city plan, an enormous plan of a city where the green is the rainforest and then the different colors are 
different stages of urbanization that I negotiated piece by piece, just like a game, just like the games you saw in the beginning, based on the, on the raw materials from the palm oil trees initially. Next, please. And, and here you see then how we, 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 by understanding the kind of intelligence of the land and the kind of categorization of the land used, we, we, we can use building kits that they also include, of course, the machinery to, to initially make the palm oil, oil and later move you know, towards different products like engineered bamboo. Uh, how with these building kits, we can actually kind of create, create these cities, design them and build them. And, and while trying to move away from the palm oil as a, as a kind of palm oil is one of the main products that goes along the, 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 the world's supply chains. Next, please. Yeah, so it can look like this or different. Eh? You could almost say it in many ways. Of course, we will have machines and technologies and refineries, but we can also have low scale, very simple houses uh, that create a kind of um, a very open terrain, uh, the city that sit, that's, that's kind of co-evolves with, with nature and co-evolves with the city. And, uh, and the project we are now discussing with the government in Indonesia is to do the same with this engineered bamboo to actually kind of reuse bamboo harvesting and move that into kind of low-cost housing projects. Next, please. And uh, of course, you have to negotiate. It's very tough because you have to get rid of the concrete industry. That sounds very simple. It's not so simple. You have to negotiate uh, who, what what are the goals. On top here, you see uh, the SDGs from the United Nations. On the right-hand side, you see stakeholders, uh, investors, uh, the law, the companies, the population. How do you negotiate with these different parties? And with the students, we're trying to work out how uh, these, these flows of decision making to to make to be able to do a project like this. And it's great fun because it kind of empowers students also. And then they go back to, often to their countries and start activate, uh, activating some of these things. So one more project that is completely different. Uh, <clears throat> next, please. And, and that is a project that, that I, I just asked Christina and Mencha that we're working on this lecture today uh, to, to get, get me a picture of today, of the BBC, right? I'm here. Shops opened yesterday for the first time. So people rush to Primark, right? Primark that sells cheap clothing. And where 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 does the where does the where does these t-shirts come? Man? This is today, right? The t-shirts and all other kind of cheap clothing that you buy in Primark is 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 comes to us along the the, the global supply chains. And in, in a particular case, for example, the, the material comes from Ethiopia. Yeah, where it's harvested, and if you're lucky, it's cotton that's harvested in Ethiopia. It's, it's put together by women, shipped as raw material to Turkey, and there it's kind of put into the cheap clothing that then is shipped along the Belt of Road to Primark. This is what we do. So let's look for a moment at the project that, that, that some students uh, built up around this, this. So now we're in Ethiopia, and what they looked at was uh, can you play that video, a bit of the video? And they looked at, uh, we listen. Our harvest is worse than before. Mom, sorry to bother you, but I need money for tuition. Oh no, if I do nothing, we will starve to die. M, you want a job in factory? No way, we only need people who can use the machine already. I am sorry, my child. Hello, ma'am, what can I do for you? I am a worker agency, I work for the community. My job is to help local people like you. Do you know BRI? I came from China one year ago, and joined this NGO soon. We are building infrastructure and community here. I don't know, what's that? Okay, well, it's fine, just follow me. There is our community. It's established by the government. 5% overseas investment are used to improve the local life quality. Hi, are you new here? Hi Leah, I have a new friend for you. Yes, they are exactly learning how to use the machine. Really? How can I? I mean, do I need to pay for the course? I don't have much money now. Basically the primary course is free. But if you want to learn more, you need community credit. We're building communities near the new road. You can always get some information here, in this community center. We consider this place as a part of city management. Welcome. For example, working in the convenient shop can get you some credits. Why don't you have a try? Please put on the uniform. You look so nice. Oh, thanks. You will like this job. People always come here because of Wi-Fi signal. When you're working, children could stay in the kindergarten. By taking care of them, you can also get credits. But, 
who runs the community? Civil servants and volunteers, like me, our fund is directly managed by local government, but with the help of some international organizations. I get it. I want to join you. I have to. That's great. Three months later, my husband find a job of constructing the new road. I also started working in the textile factory. We create cloth style by eye linking with Paris show stage. In my daughter's school, the online course starts. Now she can get the same education with Addis Ababa's school. After accumulated some credits, I try to learn about management in the community center nowadays. Everyone can get online near the convenience shops. And even electricity. Sometimes it works as a bank. Wait, I remember today is the salary day. Welcome back, miss. Here's your diagnosis. We kindly recommend you to eat more vegetable. The city changed a lot. I often go for a walk with my family along the new road. My daughter travels okay, along the um, road. And, and so on. It's, it's, it's all very, becomes actually very, you know, beautiful and so forth. Maybe a bit too optimistic. This was a kind of first time scenario with, uh, by the student team, but it's very interesting. They, they created this with the help of machine learning. That's why it's such a funny voice. But if you go into the next slide, and what is interesting here is what you see here is they actually tried to develop local local production lines. Uh, where we kind of look into a village uh, where where these women that you see saw in this video actually move, put things together and the supply the production lines are based in one village structure. So the design project was trying to see if they could improve the conditions for these women in their own villages. Next, please. And this led at, uh, at, at, at looking at a kind of analysis of how many villages of these exi actually exist in Ethiopia surrounding the, the textile factories that you see in the center of the plan here, and that supply the good. Now, you cannot change this all. Even if you hack into a system like that, you cannot just turn it on and off. Uh, but then, as architects, you can begin to improve uh, the lives of these people. This is really kind of a very particular level of kind of improvement. But because we're talking about the global supply chain system, this happens in many countries in the world. So you're talking about millions and millions of situations. And that's where the difficulty comes. And that's why we've been starting to look at new tools also, to, to look at this kind of very small uh, improvement steps. What kind of tools do we need to do to, to develop building kits that can, we can, can, can develop them and, 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 and apply them into many places. Next, please. And this is where, and of course, takes them through these kind of negotiation processes that we talked about uh, before. So this is the first time we started using a bit of machine learning here. Next, please. And the, uh, so we asked the students, do you want to learn uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning as a kind of new design tool? And the answer was basically, yes, we are interested. So we kind of made these things available. And some of the teams started to, to teach themselves. So you see, the, actually, the first embryonic attempts to do, uh, to, to do machine learning is very basic. You can find online tutorials to do this and training sets and all that. And we asked questions, okay, well, where would it be useful? And of course, it's useful in, in, in multiples and variations, right? So next. So you see some of these exercises. They're very, very basic, very simple. Hey, and then how to teach a machine to look for things like patterns in villages, right? So we, we can learn very quickly about many villages and then to create design patterns. Next, please. Uh, to, to, to create bits of, of design. Yeah. Now, so these are actually machine created uh, design layouts. They're not kind of designed, as you can see. Yeah? They're kind of awkward things. But go back one more. What is interesting about these things is that it gives access to, to large scale. So we can be, if, if we then begin to as we curate these materials, we can say, okay, uh, we, for example, how do you deal with a half a million low cost housing uh, globally? Okay. Or one billion low cost housing? How can you handle these numbers? How do we understand them? And how do, can we, we know where certain materials are efficient and not? So, this is an experimental tool development that is, sometimes looks terrible and, 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 and primitive, but it's, it's tool development we will need. Next, please. Next, please. And here you see then, you know, it, because the issue is if we start moving to new materials, we need, we need to understand how we can kind of sh phase out one material, like concrete. Here you see a graph that shows that the concrete, if you turn it into, it, it, like emissions, if you compare it to countries, it's the third largest country in the world in terms of emissions. The basic message is concrete is out. Concrete is not 
really fashionable anymore. It's like smoking, right? You can still do it privately for a nice house if you really want it. But otherwise, societally speaking, we should really phase it out and soon because we're, you know, we're trying to phase it out uh, kind of globally out of our kind of economic systems. So having said that, how do we do that? Right here you see a picture of somewhere in the center of China where the production is like this, but not only there, everywhere. So how do we phase it out? Next, please. And then we have to start learning how to, to work on processes, for example, development of wood. I'm not saying wood is the only material, but it is certainly a, a smart material that we are going to have to use on a much more massive scale. So here's a few glimpses of, of, of a design project that uses wood. They looked at Africa. Next, please. Um, yeah, so uh, we still have forests globally. We, of course, have cut them down drastically. So there's a big process towards afforestation. That means growing forests again. And that's interesting because that goes hand in hand with the kind of growing cities. Next, please. And we've looked at uh, this, this team simply looks at different types of typologies of forests uh, in, in globally. Uh, what are the types, what we can we use, how can we process them, where can we use them, next please. And of course, how can we hack and flip the, supply, the global supply chains uh, to, to spread them around. And uh, so we have to understand what is wood made of, uh, cellulose and lignin, what, what exactly, how do we process it, where is what good, what materials we can make out of it. Uh, this is partly quite scientific, next please. But it leads to the understanding of new building materials for architecture or for, for, for cities. Next, please. Next. So we look strategically now at the kind of belts of forests globally, uh, the wood belt, the bamboo belt, and then we kind of zoom in and we try to analyze where parts of these wood belts or bamboo belts exist around the, 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 uh, the global supply chains. Next, please. Yeah, and of course, they have to design cities, but there's often very little time. You can leave it one more second, maybe. We have to, you know, we, uh, this is very, very basic, but at some point students have to say, yes, we design new cities, we make new things. And then we have to, of course, start judging them like any other architect who work. You know, how do they look like? What are they made of? In this case, it's 80% wood. Next, please. And that has to do with this kind of diagram uh, that we are now looking at, for example, that wood cities would be large carbon sinks. They actually act as sequestration uh, tools. So architects can help sec uh, take carbon out of, the, out of the air and store it into both the new forests as well as into the cities. And here you see a kind of planning is of, of a kind of long-term scenario to shift towards wood as a major material into city construction. Next, please. And I have to say, actually, that's uh, Christina, who's here helping me. She's one of the co-authors of this project. And she was part of a team of, uh, of three, I think, right? Three students that worked on this project. And I have to say, it was it is an amazing project. Beautifully done and very, very high level. Uh, let, let's, let's look at two more projects. Um, am I okay, time-wise? Can I show a few more things? Yeah? Okay. Yeah, another maybe five, ten minutes. Okay, then. Um, so let's move from Africa to the Arctic and, and look at a, a project that kind of took two semesters to develop. And the, the, the Arctic is melting, and that's why the Belt and Road and the supply chains are now moving also through the Arctic. Next, please. And there's another team of students. Yeah, that is so, that's been working on data of environmental changes in the the Arctic, they call it the breathing of the earth because the Arctic is, is a kind of lung of the earth. And, uh, and, and it is also the one that's acting, that's changing the, the fastest in terms of environmental changes. Next, please. Uh, so here you see kind of some data. These are animated data of, of CO2 emissions in, in the Arctic, but, but generated by us, by the United States, by Europe. And, the way we use energy changes the Arctic. And this is, this is kind of an infographics of, of those effects. Next, please. Uh, and 
Yes. Now they started looking at, at exactly how the Belt and Road runs through the Arctic now. This is now happening, and how cities will grow in the next 10, 20 years in the Arctic Ocean on the edge of Siberia. And then they started. As I'll show you two sets of architectural toolkits next. They started to de design architectures that that link to the data ports. Uh, of the, because the, the, at the moment the supply chain through the Arctic is, is, is a data line uh, to supply us with, with uh, communication to Asia. And they started designing the building kits for those data ports so that there's the beginning of cities in the Arctic. And this is of course the barely people that will live here, very small amount. Next please. And, <coughs> And then and they shifted towards a bigger project, which is about creating a kind of international consortium of, of countries and other organizations to negotiate about the space of the Arctic. Uh, because if it's just populated, it's, it's, it's gonna be tragic. So what is possible there? How do you negotiate and how can we negotiate on the types of cities that should or could be built there? There's a total new type of type, typology. And I just wanted to show you the end of that project because it's an extreme case. I'm not sure if that's the, really the best case, but it's an extreme case in which this, this team of students connected the, the high technology needed for a power plant, <clears throat> the technology that is at the moment on the market for carbon sequestration. So they say basically with our city, we can sequestrate, let's, let's say half of the existing carbon in the world, take it out of the air, but it has to be using this technology, it has to be this big. And at the same time, we can ac accommodate some of the, the populations as that move uh, towards uh, the north. And uh, um, they've been looking at exactly where and what they could build. This is a very detailed drawing. I'll skip this for now. And they, 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 they created the, a, a video, which is, a, like I say, extreme. You don't see people, but it, it leads to the, to the aspect, to the kind of concept of geoengineering. At the moment, if you look up, in the internet, what it means, geoengineering. There are many engineers right now working on solutions a bit like this, but without the architects, that are geoengineered solutions towards climate impact. This team tried to act as architects and say, well, we can as architects build a city. Uh, and, and that's, and, but it's actually the city as a piece of geoengineering that could then take out, let's say half the carbon out of the world. These are tough decisions, right? Is it possible to do to make a decision like this? So the price of getting the carbon out of the air is high. And we will make, have to make tough, tough decisions. That's why I want to just for the last few minutes, talk a few more, talk a little bit about the project in, I want to go from the Arctic towards city making as a creative industry and talk for a few minutes about what we're doing in Berlin, because maybe we have to do simpler projects and take it step by step. And here, this is a project we're doing now with the city of Berlin. And of course, Berlin begins to look like this again. And we did, we did a kind of test project for this Bauhütte, which is really a center for the production of wood for cities in Tempelhof. And maybe we can go to the next slides fairly quickly. So he is he. We created an industrial center with students, but also as a, as a chair. How can production of, of wood components for a city look like? Berliner Stadtmachernes Kreativindustrie. Now, since a year, the city of Berlin says we would like to support wood as a main component for for housing. So then we are saying, okay, how can it be done? How do you produce? What people do you produce with? So next, please. So here you see the kind of you know, this is going back to Conscious City, who, who, how do you create awareness, who do you bring together? And, uh, and this is what we're doing now, but not in Tempelhof, because now Tegel, Tegel Project has adopted this project. So we're not doing it for real, because the city of Berlin wants to, to develop the, the, the new district in Tegel in Wood. Next, please. So we're moving away from this, this kind of value chain of producing a piece of city out of wood with all the tools we have. Next, please. Yeah, design a wood born, you know, 100% wood buildings. Then this production industry 4.0. Then there is, uh, <coughs> next, please. And then there are 
systems that we are also developing now with students. Maybe you can play one of the videos, uh, Christina. I skip this. Um, there's a big history, of course, of food making. And let's look, let's just play the first one, yeah? So we're also now training students uh, to develop wood systems that are based on kind of historical analysis, but actually made with industrial industry 4.0 methods. So all of these are produced, they're 100% wood. This is a core of a building. Uh, and this is, was a project done together with one of the housing associations in Berlin. And the idea of the Bauhütte 4.0 and Tegel is that we will actually start producing these kind of building kits, not only this one, we of course look at a wide range of possible kits with different architects. Uh, we will invite a range of architects that then uh, are brought in or are kind of through the normal kind of processes and then actually can create low cost housing for almost 100% uh, wood, actually at the price that the, that the housing associations want to get. That's the whole challenge, of course. And that's why we need to look at intelligent production. This is going back to the data flows and intelligence. We need to look at intelligent prefabrication in order to be able to build mass scale and yet with the agility and the flexibility uh, that, that, that we need for society. It is a very simple side project. Of course, this is not design yet. This is just testing how to do something and testing the nature of the link between parametrics and production. Next, please. And it's quite interesting because although on one hand, this links to the kind of forest development, and on the other hand, um, we need industry to do this together with. And that's the project that we're now building up uh, with Fraunhofer. So there's a project that's led by TU and Fraunhofer in Berlin together with uh, the city of uh, Berlin. Next, please. And I think maybe I would like to say this leads to, again, new projects on a kind of planetary scale. And the, the, the really the, the, the application of machine learning and on a, on a full blown scale. But I have a feeling we have run out of time, maybe. And maybe I should stop here yeah, and we, 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 we look at some questions. We, we, what do you think? Yeah, I think I've probably talked enough. We have now done an hour and a quarter since we started. So I think this the animations we have. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. So Until I'd like now. To, thank you. Yeah. I'd like to take some questions, actually, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And we have, like I said, we have already said that we have to do the questions in Deutsch. Yeah. 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 Could you have this ice breaking? No, we are the ice breakers. Hmm? <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you, thank you. I see a chat coming through. <laughs> Paul, das, was du, was du sagst und uh, die Art und Weise, wie du inzwischen die Welt erklären kannst, uh, zeigt ja auch, wie unglaublich komplex diese Vorgänge und Zusammenhänge sind, uh, mit denen wir es eigentlich zu tun haben. Ne? Wenn es um solche Sachen wie Klimawandel Ressourceneinsparung oder überhaupt Ressourcenerhalt geht. Wie groß siehst du die Chance, dass ein größerer Teil der Menschheit diese Systematik, diese Zusammenhänge jemals wirklich verstehen wird? Ja, wir müssen das wirklich nicht als, als komplexe, große Sachen verkaufen. Wir müssen das sehr vereinfachen. Deshalb fand ich auch die Geschichte von Greta so wichtig, die so, so einfach reden kann. Ja, und das ist so wichtig. Wir brauchen so junge Leute wie Greta, um die, die ganz einfache Narrative äh, ja. zu, zu entwickeln. Und wir müssen das auch in, in die Bauhütte in Tegel machen. Wir müssen da ähm, Bürgerbeteiligung machen. Müssen wir natürlich, weil die Wohnbaugesellschaften, die müssen äh, gesetzlich Bürgerbeteiligung machen. Und das ist eine Chance, um da Narrative zu entwickeln mit, mit vielleicht erstmal eher kleinen Gruppen von Bürgern und dann größere. Ja, um gerade dieses, diese Akzeptanz zu entwickeln, weil nicht überhaupt noch keine Akzeptanz da für, für, für Wohnen in Holz. Und wenn Frau Longscher, der Senatorin, das will jetzt, ein Modellquartier in Holz, heißt das nicht, dass das plötzlich, dass die Menschen das allen wollen. So, wir müssen erstmal schauen, gibt es die Akzeptanz? Und, was ist da möglich? Wie kann man auch selber mitentwerfen? 
Wenn, wenn, wenn man dann tatsächlich in dieses Schumacherquartier reinkommt, wie tragt man dann tatsächlich bei? Ne? Und wie viel will man beitragen ne? an, die, an die, die Zukunft der Stadt als Beispiel ne? für, für, für die Entwicklung von einer Carbon, also kohlenstoffneutrale Stadt? Das ist ja ein Ziel von Berlin. Ja. Und das, das ist gar nicht einfach. Ne? Wir müssen mit, mit, mit Video, Leute, Künstler und ja. mit vielen Leuten arbeiten, die dann die die Geschichte entwickeln, die Narrative entwickeln, ja. um Leute mitzubringen. Das, das heißt, die ganze Komplexität, die muss, die, die muss, die muss nicht, überhaupt nicht immer sichtbar sein. Überhaupt nicht. Ja. Ja. Wenn sonst keiner eine Frage hat aus dem Publikum, würde ich vielleicht nochmal auf diese Datascapes zu sprechen kommen. Ja. Die haben ja auch eine sehr große ästhetische Qualität. Sie sind Informationsträger, stellen Unsichtbares, was wir sonst nicht sehen würden, im Kontext da, aber sind eben auch äh, sehr attraktive Artefakte. Inwieweit aus Ihrer Sicht okay. ist diese ähm, Gestaltung der Datascapes, dieser Artefakte, wichtig für den weiteren Entwurfsprozess, um Entscheidungen zu treffen? Sie sind ja nicht nur rein rationale Ergebnisse einer Forschungsarbeit, sondern haben wir auch eine gestalterische Qualität. Ja, ja, sehr wichtig. Ich habe, wir haben unglaublich viele Reaktionen bekommen. Ich, ich, ich reise jetzt äh, immer mehr mit diesen mit diese, äh, diese Objekten rund. Und es äh, ist unglaublich, weil die Leute reagieren, weil man, äh, man, man, man kann es in der Hand halten. Dann sagen wir hier, das, zum Beispiel, wir haben eine wahnsinnig schöne, und das zeigt die, die, die gesamte Menge von Plastik, Plastic Waste, ja, in die, die Ozeanen. Das ist Wahnsinn. Die Leute sagen, was? Das hatte ich mich nie gedacht. Das heißt, wir haben jetzt etwa 30 diese Data Spheres. Und die, die, die Leute sagen, das ist wichtig, weil es ist nicht nur Information, es ist auch wieder haptisch. Es gibt ja eine menschliche Geschichte, die an, immer wieder ja, gibt es Bilder von Menschen, die irgendwie das, ein Bild der Welt in der Hand halten. Das ist ganz wahnsinnig wichtig, um das auf so eine Art zu erzählen. Look, when you build like this, this is what the world will, will, will be like, or more of this. If you build like this, maybe you can go in this direction. So es gibt Möglichkeiten der Wahl, ja, das Mitmachen. Und das, glaube ich, das, glaube ich, ist wichtig. Und und auch immer wieder hin zurück zum Groß und Klein, ja, diese Kosmolo kosmologische Gedanken, das müssen wir einfach, und das haben wir jetzt, he, mit dem mit der Coronavirus he, leben wir wieder mal wirklich äh, so global. Natürlich haben wir natürlich Grenzen, die sich schließen und so weiter und so weiter, aber das Virus ist global. Und, ähm, und das ist eine good lesson, you know, big lessons we are learning right now. Das wird tatsächlich global, wir müssen zusammenarbeiten, um das Virus irgendwie zu, zu bewältigen, weil das ist da, es ist nicht weg. Und, äh, und äh, diese Lessons müssen wir lernen. Und, und das sind auch Narrative, das sind dann Narrative. Und das ist nah am Körper, ja, ich werde krank, vielleicht überlebe ich nicht. Das, der Angst ist groß. Mhm. Äh, und, äh, okay, wir haben... Genau, ja. und eine Frage von Niklas. Genau, ja. hast du auch dein Video an. Genau, danke. Genau, genau. Eine generelle Frage, so, vielleicht können Sie das auch gar nicht so beantworten. Ähm, jetzt sagen viele ja auch, man soll nachhaltig bauen, oder das ist ja auch eine Kern, das ist ja auch ein sehr guter Gedanke. Und dann gehen auch viele auf das Material Holz. Ähm, da, ist, da ist meine Frage, ist es denn wirklich nachhaltig zu sagen, ich nehme Holz, also gerade jetzt in der Bauindustrie, die ja immer weiter wächst, man sieht es an Beispielen wie Dubai, ähm, wenn ich mir jetzt vorstelle, dass man da alles aus Holz baut, dann nimmt ja der Regenwald drastisch ab. Ich glaube, so schnell kann man da ja überhaupt nicht nachhelfen, dass es wieder aufbaut und dann unterstützt man das doch eigentlich, dass der CO2-Gehalt, also der Kohlenstoffdioxidgehalt wächst weil die Bäume das überhaupt nicht mehr schaffen, alles aufzunehmen. Oder sehe ich das jetzt falsch? Ich hatte das Gleiche geglaubt. Aber dann habe ich mich erzählen lassen, dass es überhaupt nicht stimmt. Zum Beispiel Brandenburg hat viel zu viel Holz. Wir, wir arbeiten jetzt zusammen mit, mit Experten, so wie FH Eberswalde und das Land Brandenburg und so weiter. Die sagen, wir haben, wir haben viermal mehr Holz in Brandenburg, gerade jetzt, als wir brauchen, um, um alle Wohnungen die ganze Wohnungsbau in Berlin, also 200.000 Einheiten mit Holz zu bauen. 
Das hatte ich auch nicht geglaubt. Mhm. Das heißt, man kann Holz anbauen und nicht, es ist nicht eine Frage von wegnehmen. Aber das ist so, genau so eine Schichte, Geschichte, das hatte ich auch nicht erwartet, wo wir, wo, wir, ja, wo wir erzählen müssen. Wir müssen sagen, ja, aber, und da muss jemand von vom, vom der Försterabteilung, von, von der von Försterabteilung von Eberswalder muss kommen und erzählen, genau, wie das eigentlich aussieht, das wusste ich auch nicht. Ich hatte keine Ahnung, dass es viermal so viel gibt. Es ist natürlich nicht so einfach, weil nicht alles ist direkt benutzbar, aber es gibt, das ist eine Ebene. Ja? Wir müssen natürlich nicht. Das, zum Beispiel das Projekt, was wir jetzt in Indonesien hoffentlich starten, ist eine, eine Substitutionierung von Palmölanbau für Bambusanbau. Das heißt, wir würden nichts wegnehmen. Aber mit dem Substitutionieren von Palmöl können wir wenigstens ein nachhaltiges Produkt entwickeln für die Stadtentwicklung. Und dann hoffen wir, dass daraus mit diesen äh, diese Negotiation Systems, dass wir vielleicht das Wald wieder anwachsen lassen. Das ist ein My Dream Image, right? Mhm. Und, und das führt zu einem viel größeren Thema, nämlich dass die, die Weltorganisationen, die wollen jetzt Wälder wachsen lassen. Ja? Aber ein Wald zu wachsen zu lassen, das braucht eine Wirtschaft. Man kann nicht einfach Bäume pflanzen. Ich weiß, dass auf der Internet gibt es diese Geschichte. So, es braucht eine Art Synergie zwischen Stadtwachstum und, und, und Waldwachstum, dass, dass, wir, dass wir irgendwie im Griff machen müssen. Und das ist zum Teil wirtschaftlich bedingt. Und äh, ich, hab, ich, ich kann noch einige Bilder, ein Projekt zeigen, wo genau das passiert. Ja, das ist eine, eine Art Bewirtschaft, Bewirtschaftung zwischen Großmaßstäblich Wald. Anbau und Stadtbau. Äh, aber vielleicht noch mal eine Frage. Diese, das sind genau die, die Fragen, die wir, womit wir kulturell umgehen müssen. Und ich, ich, muss, ich war überhaupt nicht in, im Thema Holz bis einige Jahre zurück. Aber jetzt sehe ich, dass es ein notwendiges Produkt ist. Übrigens in, im Süden, also Indonesien und China und so weiter, reden wir mehr über Bambus, weniger über Holz. In sich selber. Es geht ja um, um Compressed Bambus. Ich, ich würde vielleicht nochmal einen Versuch unternehmen, die, die Fragen und Anmerkungen, die es jetzt gerade gab, nochmal zusammenzubinden und vielleicht sie dazu nochmal um Zettel bitten. Und zwar die Frage danach, ob Holz, ob es sinnvoll ist, Holz einzusetzen oder nicht, die ist ja so schwierig zu beantworten. Die ist in Brandenburg ganz anders zu beantworten als in Bayern oder Schleswig-Holstein. Und wenn wir dann aus Deutschland rausgehen, in Nordeuropa anders zu beantworten als in Südeuropa. Und wenn wir es auf einer globalen Ebene betrachten, wieder muss es wieder differenziert werden. Das heißt, alleine bei der Frage, wie welche Rohstoffe wir wofür einsetzen, sind die Antworten, sind die Einflussfaktoren derartig komplex, dass es, so, dass es eigentlich nicht möglich ist, eine pauschale Antwort zu geben. Also wir müssen ja auch aufpassen, dass Baumaterialien nicht irgendwann in Konkurrenz zur Nahrungsmittelproduktion oder sowas stehen. Also ja, absolut. Und, so, und so weiter und so fort. Das heißt, wir reden hier von einer extrem hohen Komplexität. Da hilft es natürlich auf der einen Seite diese sehr grafischen Darstellungen, äh, zu haben, um zu erklären. Ich habe mich so ein bisschen gefragt, wie das ist mit den einfachen Narrativen, ob, ob das nicht sozusagen auch das Mittel derjenigen ist, die ähm, jetzt im Moment äh, nach meiner Wahrnehmung unsere Gesellschaften in äh, weniger günstige Richtungen äh, schieben. Also was ich meine ist, ähm, vor etwa einem Jahr war ich bei einer Podiumsdiskussion zum äh, Phoenixsee äh, in, in Dortmund und dann gab es ein Teilnehmer dieser Diskussion, ähm, der also wirklich sehr, sehr freudig darüber berichtigt, dass es da ja endlich mal einen Bürgermeister gab, äh, der sich durchgesetzt hat und der da auch gegen Widerstände einfach mal was gemacht hat und so weiter und so fort. Ne? Also ich mache es kurz. Es das, das, das drückte sich so eine, so eine gewisse Sehnsucht nach einem starken Führer aus, ne? nach jemandem, der einfache Antworten hat, der, äh, der auch mal was gegen Widerstände durchmacht. In Ihrem Vortrag war viel häufiger von Partizipation die Rede, von der Visualisierung komplexer äh, Zusammenhänge. Ähm, ich habe immer die Sorge, wenn wir, auf, äh, auf der einen Seite müssen wir Komplexität abbilden, auf der anderen Seite ähm, führt diese Komplexität zu einer Sehnsucht nach Vereinfachung. Ähm, und ich frage mich, wenn wir sozusagen, diese, wenn wir dann mit einfachen Narrativen arbeiten, ist das nicht etwas, was irgendwann zurückschießt, also backfires, ne? also, weil wir dann quasi Mittel verwenden, die Mittel derjenigen verwenden, die, wir, die, die eigentlich ähm, ja, unsere Gesellschaft in eine meines Erachtens falsche Richtung schieben. Ja, klar. Das ist, das ist auch 
ist auch schwierig. Gerade wenn wir auch hier mit, mit, mit Ländern aus China arbeiten, wo es dann natürlich verschiedene, die Narrative der Belt and Road ist, ist, ist sehr geladen, ja. Es ist nicht ein offizielles Projekt, und trotzdem ist es eine offizielle Initiative. Wenn man auch die, die, die Geldflüsse nachvollzieht, das, das sind keine Staatsgelder, das sind dann wieder Banken von Banken und so weiter. Ja, das heißt, die, die Frage ist auch, wer ist eigentlich dabei und was ist der Zukunft der, der, der Architekten in dieses ganze, diese ganze Entwicklung? Mhm. In, 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 ich, hab, ich, mach mich, ich habe lange Zeit mich große Sorgen gemacht für das Beruf des Architekten. In, in, in den USA werden mehr als 50 Prozent der Architekten werden jetzt eingemietet durch Internetfirmen, um ihre Häuser zu bauen. Da sind die Architekten so on the bottom of the food chain. Ja. Jetzt kämpfe ich dafür, dass Architekten wieder an wirklich eine zentrale Rolle nehmen. In, in, als kulturelle Aktivisten, würde ich mal <lacht> so sagen. Um, um dann tatsächlich ja, Architekten entwerfen. Entwerfen hat zu tun mit, mit Emotionen, ja, mit Schönheit und so. Und so weiter. Es, es, es reißt Leute mit oder vielleicht nicht. Aber es sind kulturelle Aktivisten in, in dem Sinne. Das finde ich ganz wichtig. Da haben wir wirklich eine große Rolle zu spielen. Und ja, um die, 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 die Komplexität, Komplexität ja, wenigstens in den Griff zu bekommen. Ja, und ja das, also die Frage danach, wie Komplexität, Komplexität in den Griff zu bekommen ist und, und wie. Ähm Entscheidungen, die auf komplexen Sachverhalten äh, basieren, kommuniziert werden können, ähm, vielleicht sogar vorher getroffen werden können, wie herbeigeführt werden können, das finde ich eine der zentralen Fragen in unserem Beruf. Ja. Ja, zum Beispiel dann, eine Studentin, die jetzt auch abstudiert, ich habe jetzt seit zwei Semester auch gearbeitet an einem, an einem großen Studio vom, 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 zum Thema Abholzen von Sibirien. Weil ja, wenn wir wenn in Köln oder Berlin Holz kaufen, dann kommt das wahrscheinlich aus Sibirien, ja, auf dem Belt and Road. Oder vielleicht, wenn wir ein bisschen besser sind, aus Österreich. Ja. Oder Bayern. Aber die, die, Masse, die, die Massen kommen aus Sibirien. Und sie hat das total durchgearbeitet. Und sie arbeitet im Moment an, an einem System, um zu schauen, ist es möglich, das gesamte Paket äh, von vom Russlands äh, Low-Cost-Housing, ja, bezahlbarer Wohnungbau, um das tatsächlich mit neuem Waldanbau zu ermöglichen. Und das ist ganz interessant, weil es, es involviert Design, aber auch Produktion und tatsächlich äh, Prozesse des, des, des Verhandelns ja, in Städten mit Bürgermeistern, mit Leuten und so weiter, ja, um das in, in einem Land, sie ist doch Sinn, als Russland, das, das zu ermöglichen. Und das heißt, was ich wichtig finde, ist, dass das Student auch diese Prozesse lernen. Dass der Student nicht nur entwerfen können, aber auch verhandeln können. Und auch vielleicht so eine Richtung setzen können. Vor allem international natürlich. Wir sind sehr international als TU. Ich habe Studenten von der ganzen Welt. Und viele davon werden jetzt zurückgehen. Vielleicht einige werden tatsächlich Top-Architekten, einige nicht. Einige werden in Büros arbeiten, aber viele werden auch als, äh, ja, I would call that future leaders äh, auftreten. Und dann, da würden, äh, finde ich, dass es wichtig ist, dass diese Studenten auch die ganze Prozesse, was sie auch machen, nach, ja, die, die ganze Prozesse, die, ja, die, die ganze Value Chain of Architectural Design im Griff haben, aber auch zu sagen, ja, wir können dadurch eine, eine, eine Rolle spielen, zum Beispiel in, in Bewältigung von Klima, Climate Impact. Das ist eine soziale, Social Contract, eine soziale Verantwortung. Wie auch, wie auch dann, äh, ob man dann zurückgeht nach China oder in Indonesien oder Griechenland oder Kenia. Das sind natürlich große Unterschiede, aber die, was wir jetzt teilen, wie beim, beim Coronavirus, ist, ist größer, als was, was der Unterschied ist. Wir teilen mehr jetzt das menschliche Bevölkerung, als dass als, als das wir kulturelle Unterschiede haben. Und das heißt, wir müssen auch über Standards reden und Sachen, die, die standardisiert sind und dann vielleicht lokal äh, flexibel sind und mhm. kulturell unterschiedlich sind. Mhm. Das ist sehr spannend. Ich glaube, da wird es eine wirklich eine große Umwandlung des, 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 des Fachbereichs, des Fachs Architektur geben jetzt. Das bleibt abzuwarten. Ne? 
Ich ja. denke, ähm, wir haben jetzt keine Fragen mehr im Chat. Ich weiß nicht, ob jemand noch ja, es gibt noch sich anderweitig melden will. Jetzt, da kommt noch eine, genau. Vielleicht anschließend äh, an diese Diskussion, äh, wie sich Komplexität in den Griff bekommen lässt und wie wir informierte Entscheidungen treffen. Ähm, Sie haben ja in Ihrem Vortrag gezeigt, dass digitale Technologien durchaus ein großen Bestandteil bilden in dem Entwicklungsprozess. Inwieweit sehen Sie da die Möglichkeit, über maschinelles Lernen oder aber auch künstliche Intelligenz dort äh, Entscheidungen vorzubereiten, die wir als Architekten natürlich letztendlich treffen sollten am Ende, aber da die Komplexität in den Griff zu bekommen, ähm, auch im Verhältnis dazu, dass es ja diese Szenarien auch äh, von anderen Perspektiven gibt, äh, brauchen wir überhaupt noch den Architekten, die Architektin, ähm, über die digitalen Technologien haben wir heutzutage die Möglichkeit, vom Data Mining über Data Driven Design bis zu Informed Design Decisions eigentlich diesen ganzen Prozess automatisiert abbilden zu lassen. Ja, das ist eine große Frage. Wir arbeiten daran, dass es da kommt ein Dilemma. Und deshalb rede ich weniger über Smart City jetzt und mehr über die Intelligenz in der Stadt, weil wir arbeiten auch auf Systeme, die intelligent werden. So zum Beispiel mehr und mehr Systeme der, der, der Stadt sind jetzt intelligent und die geben wir auch, die übergeben wir eine Art Intelligenz. Wir fragen ein, ein Traffic Manager System, um uns effizient zu verwalten. Ja, und so weiter und so weiter. Immer mehr von diesen Systemen sind intelligent und in eine Stadt kommt dann ein Aggregat von Systemen und dann brauchen wir diesen Brainbox. Ja, wer kontrolliert dann eigentlich diese Systeme? Und wer entscheidet, was gut ist, was wir wollen? Ja, wollen wir alles, alles mit autonomes Auto ausstatten oder auch nicht? Äh, und, äh, und für die Architektin ist das auch wichtig. Sind, äh, wollen wir alles total effizient gestalten oder vielleicht auch nicht? Und das, da sind natürlich die, die Architekten, die haben eine wichtige Rolle, gerade auf kultureller Ebene. Ja, das heißt, die, die, das, die, das Setzen von Prioritäten. Ich habe das kleine, die kleine Skizze gezeigt, ja, die Bifurcations, ja, welche, welche Zukunft haben wir, wollen wir haben. Und einige Sachen davon können wir übergeben an intelligente Systeme, aber dann zum Beispiel, wenn wir alle intelligenten Systeme in der Stadt fragen, wer macht mal unsere Stadt äh, kohlenstofffrei? Das kann sein, dass wir dann die, die Lösungen dieses intelligenten Systems überhaupt nicht gerne haben. Mhm. <lacht> dann müssen wir Entscheidungen machen, die kulturell sind. Auf der anderen Seite ist es auch toll, wir, wir entdecken jetzt auch, dass die, der Einsatz von Intelligence, ich, ich habe noch einige Slides, die, 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 das, das noch zeigt, wo wir jetzt hingehen mit, mit Maschine, maschinelles Lernen. Und es ist ein tolles Design-Tool. Damit können wir tatsächlich die, die, kind of, die Datenmengen von, von den wechselnden Städten weltweit vielleicht angehen. Sonst kann no human soul can design on the scale. Äh, aber wir müssen, wir müssen auch mitmachen auf einem großen Maßstab. Und das ist toll, um das als, jetzt als kreatives Design-Tool zu sehen, weil maschinelles Lernen ist nicht intelligent, ist dumm. Ja, es ist ein sehr dummes Prozess. Äh, das Wort Intelligenz ist noch eine Metapher äh, im Moment. Da ist kein Consciousness in einer Maschine. Äh, das, es ist eine Art von Intelligenz, weil es einfach viel, 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 viel machen kann. Und das ist manchmal sehr gut für uns, weil wir brauchen einfach viele, viele Sachen. So, zum Beispiel wissen wir jetzt, dass wahrscheinlich in den nächsten zehn Jahren in die Südhälfte der Welt zweimal so viel gebaut wird, als jetzt in der Welt existiert. Ja, rechne das mal um im Sinne von Emissionen. Ja, alles Beton und Zahl und so weiter. Rechne das mal um. Das heißt, wir müssen, als Architekten müssen wir auch mit diesen Mengen mal, mal umgehen. He? Können wir Häusertypen entwickeln, he? die man da einsetzen kann in Kenia und in Indonesien. Ja. Mit, und da müssen wir nicht alles gleich machen. Das ist überhaupt nicht so. Aber vielleicht voneinander lernen. Das ist ja, das sind, das sind, das sind, da was Sie gerade ansprechen, das sind ja genau die Dinge, die wir auf einer globalen Ebene adressieren müssen. Dass wir zum Teil gar keine Ahnung davon haben, was in anderen Bereichen der Welt überhaupt abgeht. Ne? Also wie viel Stadt gebaut wurde in China in den letzten zehn Jahren, das ist ja unglaublich. Ich würde ähm, jetzt ja. noch die ähm, beiden Fragen von Kai Badov, ja, gerne. Badov, gerne. Badov äh, ja. und Louis ähm, äh, hier auch. in den Ring werfen. Ähm, der Kai, äh, möchtest du, möchten Sie äh, die Frage selber stellen oder ist er da? Gerne Mikro an, Kamera an. 
Also er ist noch da, aber ich glaube, jetzt passiert was. So sensationell. Wir sehen ihn. <lacht> jetzt nicht mehr. Das Mikro an, ja, wunderbar. Ich muss mal das Mikro einstecken. Hallo erstmal. Ähm, Hallo. Ja, meine Frage zieht so ein bisschen darauf ab. Man kennt das ja aus dem Berufsalltag. Man, man, man muss sich viel mit Behörden rumschlagen. Es dauert lange, bis irgendwelche Flächennutzungspläne angepasst werden und gleichzeitig verändert sich die Gesellschaft ja immer schneller. Gerade angefeuert von Sachen wie Social Media und da ist einfach die Frage, sind wir, sind wir noch gewappnet dafür auf den gesellschaftlichen Wandel quasi direkt? Ich habe jetzt nicht ausgehört. Die letzte Frage. Ähm, ja, noch mal. Also die letzte Fassung sind, sind, sind wie die demokratischen Prozesse, die wir uns geschafft haben im Bereich Baurecht, Bauleitplanung, jetzt das ist natürlich sehr deutschlandspezifisch, aber sind die noch quasi... Ist es damit möglich, auf einen immer schnelleren gesellschaftlichen Wandel zu reagieren? Oder wie sehen Sie da die Möglichkeit, dass, also, dass das angepasst wird, dass man schneller reagieren kann? Ja, ich habe jetzt da nichts, ich wollte ein sehr breites Spektrum zeigen. Ich habe aber zum Beispiel diese, in der Bauhütte in Betegel werden wir, untersuchen wir im Moment ein bisschen diesen, den Workflow ja, von, des Architekten. Zum Beispiel, wenn wir dann nachher 10, 20 Architekten äh, um, Tisch, um den Tisch bringen oder die ein, wir werden eingeladen um, für den Vergabeprozess ja, für, für das Distrikt, für den Quartier, das Schumacher, das Schumacher Quartier, dann, dann, dann müssen wir verstehen, äh, wo wir in diesen normalen, rechtlich festgelegten Vergabeprozessen, ja, der Workflow eines Architekten, wo wir da noch möglich haben, zum Beispiel um prototypische Bauweisen in Schumacher Quartier entwickeln zu lassen. Das heißt, diese Bauhütte, die habe ich relativ rasch gezeigt, ist zum Teil ein innovatives Produktionszentrum, das mit regionales Holz Stadt bauen will. Aber es ist auch ein Forschungs- und Entwicklungszentrum, um überhaupt zu zeigen, was ist denn eigentlich Bauen in Holz? Weil wir wissen das noch nicht. Ich habe morgen ein Team-Meeting, wo wir zum Beispiel eine Matrix zusammenbringen werden mit einem Projekt, wo wir vielleicht 20 prototypische Bauweisen Holz zusammenlegen werden. Einige haben wir entwickelt, einige kommen von Kollegen, einige kommen von großen Firmen. Die werden, und dann werden wir untersuchen, ist es möglich, dass wir zum Beispiel durch Cross-Financing für verschiedene Architekten die Chance geben und natürlich Wohnbaugesellschaften. Ja, es geht um die, die Bauer. Baufirmen sind Wohnbaugesellschaften und Zugmassenschaften, dass wir sagen, okay, wir wollen 20 Bauweisen Holz, fünf davon sind hofst experimentell, wir haben einen Equivator, die müssen subventioniert sein, weil es ist überhaupt nicht bezahlbar. Und es ist überhaupt kein Proof of Concept, weil wir wissen noch nicht, ob die industriell vorgefertigt werden können überhaupt. Und vielleicht fünf sind total Standard, wie ich sehe. Die werden mit bestehenden Baufirmen, Gropius oder Zegbau oder Kaufmann oder so, und äh, werden, die, werden die entwickelt. Und, äh, und dann ist die, die, die Frage, ist, wir wollen dann ein ganzes Spektrum entwickeln. Einige, einige sind experimentell und einige sind, da ist meine Katze noch kommt durch, <lacht> einige sind dann experimentell, einige, einige sind dann äh, cross-financed, um zu schauen, sind die prototypischen Bauweisen in Schumacher überhaupt ein einsetzbar auf, Maß, auf großem Maßstab in Deutschland? 400.000 zum Beispiel. Wissen wir noch nicht. Das ist alles offen. Wir haben noch keine fixe Lösung, überhaupt nicht. Aber die Frage ist sehr gut, weil wir müssen uns tatsächlich diese Vergabeprozesse anschauen. Sehr schwierig, weil wir können das ja nicht ändern. Wir können nicht ja zehn Architekten einladen. Wir müssen sich bewerben. Ja? Das sind Vergabeprozesse. Auf der anderen Seite, die Firmen, die die, Bau die, die Holzprozesse für die Holzprozesse kommen in die Bauhütte, die, müssen, die haben einen Marktanteil oder wollen einen Marktanteil. Das wird sehr schwierig. Da müssen wir so verhandeln zwischen die beiden Marktanteilen und da müssen wir tatsächlich verstehen, okay, what's in it? Hey, workflow of an architect. Wo haben wir noch so Drehmomente? Ja, wo können wir die Schrauben ein bisschen drehen? Und ein bisschen steuern vielleicht. vielleicht es, bleibt, es bleibt ein Inkubatorprojekt, das neue Distrikt. Vielleicht ist einer der ähm Aspekte, der auch in dem Zusammenhang eine Rolle spielt, der Titel Ihres Instituts, Conscious, Conscious City, also die bewusste Stadt, dass wir uns Dinge bewusst machen, zum Beispiel, dass wir uns bewusst machen, dass 
Prozesse, die nicht so schnell reagieren können auf gesellschaftlichen Wandel, gar nicht so schlecht sind, sondern Ausdruck von Mitsprachemöglichkeiten, von Partizipationsmöglichkeiten. Also ja. dass wir sozusagen gar nicht versuchen, Systeme zu ändern, sondern vielleicht Bewusstsein zu ändern für Systeme, Bewusstsein für Prozesse und, und den Blick auf solche Prozesse äh, verändern. Und dass das vielleicht dabei hilft, äh, ähm, mit, mit dem Wandel, den wir erleben, äh, klarzukommen. Aber das ist... Ähm, ja, Na, erstmal nur eine These, nur ein Gedanke und kein, also, äh, keine fertige, äh, kein fertiges Konzept. Die Frage von Louis, ähm, ist Louis noch da? Wer möchte der Louis die Frage selber stellen? Ähm, Louis äh, meldet sich jetzt gerade nicht, dann lese ich die Frage vor. Die Frage lautet, sind Ihre Analysen und Vorschläge unter der Voraussetzung eines kapitalistischen Systems oder ist ein Wechsel des gesamten ökonomischen Systems doch der bessere Weg? Reduzieren unseres Konsums zum Beispiel. <lacht> Denn wir können nicht für die Ewigkeit wachsen. Voraussetzung ist des kapitalistischen Gedankens, äh, sei das. Ja, ja. Ah, und, und dann schreibt Louis, die Kamera sei defekt. Das habe, ja, musste ich jetzt die Frage. Große Frage. Da würde ich keine sehr direkte Antwort aufgeben, weil ich, ich, ich arbeite in, auch in Ländern mit sehr verschiedenen politischen Systemen und Manchmal, you know, you have to try what you can, can do, aber die, die Frage ist sehr gut. Ich habe natürlich auch extreme Studenten, die sagen, nein, das muss total radikal umgewandelt werden. Ich habe im Moment in meinem heutigen Studio, es gibt ein Team, die, die arbeiten an das Thema Commons, dass es komplett neue kind of, kommunale Entscheidungsprozesse geben muss, um diese Massenproduktion zu steuern. Und dann kommt das Thema Commons. Und so weiter kommt dabei in Blockchain und kommt total neue Tools, die überhaupt nicht mehr basiert sind auf die heutigen Marktsysteme. Ich fördere das, ich finde das gut, ich finde das großartig. Was genau das Beste ist, weiß ich auch nicht. Wir haben natürlich auch in Deutschland haben wir den Plattenbau, ja, das kommt, kommt aus einem System, was auch anders war als das heutige System. Ganz interessant heute, um das anzuschauen. Das war zum Teil innovativ. Das war auf Basis von industrieller Innovation. Ob schon, wir kennen natürlich die politische Geschichte heute. Aber ich glaube tatsächlich, es müssen Änderungen geben. Mhm. Politisch. Und dann ist es interessant, in Ländern als, als, als Indonesien oder Kenia zu schauen, genau wer, wer übernimmt das, wer, wer will das machen. Es sind zum Teil. Ministerien, die manchmal mit jungen Leuten besetzt sind, die wirklich neue Businessmodelle haben oder neue Modelle für, für Entwicklung haben, und dann muss man die suchen und damit arbeiten, ähm, auch wenn das ganze System noch nicht oder nicht geändert werden kann. Dann haben wir jetzt noch mal Niklas Schmitz mit genau. seiner zweiten Frage und ich würde sagen, damit beschließen wir die Runde. Ähm, es ist mittlerweile kurz vor neun. Ähm, da müssen noch einige lange ausharren für ihre äh, Kammerpunkte. Ja, das, <lacht> äh, ich bewundere das. Ich bewundere okay. das. Ähm, ähm, Niklas, bitte. Genau, ich hatte nur den Gedanken, ist es vielleicht machbar oder macht es vielleicht Sinn, dass man vielleicht auch politisch an das Ganze rangeht? Also immer mehr Gesetze gibt es ja zum Thema ähm, ja, Energietechnik im Haus, in Neubauten oder Dachbegrünungen, da gibt es ja immer mehr gesetzliche Regelungen. Macht es vielleicht Sinn, auch da zu sagen, man, man arbeitet sich Stückchen weiter ran und geht ich, ich beispielsweise mit 20 Prozent Holzanteil an so einen Neubau und steigert das Ganze um die Jahre, dass man so auch ja, gesetzlich festlegt, dass wir irgendwann in die Richtung Holz gehen? Oder würden Sie sagen, das macht keinen Sinn, das muss jeder Architekt für sich selber entscheiden oder jeder äh, Bauherr, wie er das denn haben möchte? Nee, das ist ein guter Punkt. Äh, wir müssen tatsächlich schauen, dass zu, zu, zum Beispiel im Moment ähm, steht in der, in der Plan für Schumacher Quartier, äh, das passiert auf der Plan B, das äh, jetzt entwickelt worden ist, dass wenigstens 50 Prozent mit äh, Bau mit Holz angestrebt werden sollte. Ja? Denn wir wollen das erhöhen. Wir wollen sagen, nee, vielleicht gibt es Teile, wo man 60 Prozent, dann 70, dann 80 Prozent und dann aus Mischformen. Ja? Wir können auch zum Beispiel sagen, wir wollen Zirkularität erzeugen, durch Waste Plastics einzubauen. Ja? Das sind andere Materialien mitzunehmen. Nicht nur Holz natürlich, das geht überhaupt nicht. Und dann ist die Frage tatsächlich sehr gut, kann, können wir dann da Mischformen entwickeln, dass wir dadurch eine Art Reallabor entwickeln? dass nicht eine Entwurfsweise dann der, der Winner, Gewinner ist, aber dass das Gesamte dann ein Bild gibt, wo auch dann der Bund sagen kann, hey, die, auf diese Art und Weise können wir die, die Bauindustrie äh, Anweisungen geben. 
Technologie für Innovation. Äh, und, und, aber dann, dafür muss man wirklich ein Critical Mass vom ganzen äh, Quartier haben. Und das stimmt ganz, dass man über Zeit die Innovation noch weiterentwickeln kann. Deshalb reden wir immer über äh, Building Kits, äh, Baukasten und so weiter. Äh, dass das, das, äh, Systeme austauschbar sind, dass Elemente austauschbar sind, dass vielleicht äh, intelligente Technologien, die jetzt funktionieren, in zwei Jahren ausgetauscht werden müssen. Oder dass die Gesetze über kind of Green Building und so weiter, dass die auch, die, 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 die ändern sich schneller, ja? dass, dass die, die, die Gebäude anpassungsfähig sein. Das sind alles Betreiber-Sachen, nicht Entwurf, aber des Betriebs eigentlich. Ich habe noch gar noch nicht über Zirkularität geredet, aber dann muss man tatsächlich mit, mit Building Kits entwickeln. Das ist alles Teil vom Design. Das ist alles Teil vom Design. Und das ist ganz spannend, weil ich, das, ja. ja. Ja, ich denke, ich habe gerade den Niklas Schmitz habe ich kennengelernt im, äh, im letzten Semester, in seinem ersten Semester. Das heißt, äh, das sind alles Fragen, die wir noch äh, zu behandeln haben. Äh, vielleicht hat äh, Niklas Schmitz die Möglichkeit, das in seinem weiteren Studium äh, an unserer Fakultät äh, noch ein bisschen zu vertiefen. Wir werden uns ja dann im, im Wintersemester im kommenden auch sehen, äh, in ressourcenschonendem Bauen. Ähm, unter anderem. Vielleicht haben wir aber auch die Gelegenheit, äh, weitere Fragen und weitere Themen in einem vielleicht zukünftigen, erneuten weiteren Vortrag ähm, von Raoul, Raoul Bünzroten äh, zu vertiefen, ähm, diese Themen zu verfolgen. Für den Moment würde ich sagen, ähm, herzlichen Dank, ganz herzlichen Dank äh, für Ihre Zeit. Äh, für Ihr Kommen können wir ja nicht sagen, äh, in diesen Zeiten. Ähm,